Now I am very excited to invite up Michael Baum um, uh, to have a conversation about the billion dollar startup. Let me introduce you to Michael and then I will invite you up. He's the founder and former CEO of Splunk, one of the most successful IPOs of 2012. He's the creator of Founder.org, which gave a million dollars in grants to university startups last year, including $200,000 to UC Berkeley startups. Thank you, Founder.org. Uh, Founder.org has also led the seed rounds of nine student startups. Um, his companies have created more than 3,000 jobs. His career has spanned 25 years. He's had six startups, created over 150 millionaires. Um, he knows how to create great companies, knows how to win in new markets. I can think of no better person to talk about finding billion dollar startups and few people who are more exciting to share his experience with us. Please welcome me in joining Michael Baum to the stage. Michael. Thanks for coming, Michael. So I happen to have looked up the stock price of Splunk this morning, and I realize it's a $10 billion company. Um, and so perhaps we, we set the order of magnitude of our conversation today low, um, and I apologize for that. Uh, we, didn't, we weren't prepared for that. But um, I mean, it's got to feel good that you've created a lot of value out of that company. But what does Splunk do, and how did it get to where it is today? Well, we, we started in 2003. Who remembers what happened in 2003 in Silicon Valley? Yeah, we all had bubble gum on our face, right? <laughs> yeah, the bubble burst. And it was absolutely the worst time in the world to start a company, right? Nobody wanted to work at a startup. Nobody wanted to invest in a startup. Nobody wanted equity in a startup. The whole valley was in this low energy state. And uh, it turned out it was absolutely the best time in the world to start a company because all the real entrepreneurs were still with us and all the vacationing entrepreneurs were back doing other things. Um, so the, um, you know, like any company, we had to build a great team and the first 10, 20 people in the company were just rock star engineers, marketing people, people who really wanted to make a difference and do something interesting and unique. So we, we were tackling uh, the very difficult problem of data center automation. And I was, uh, prior to this at Yahoo, running the e-commerce business there, had got there via the acquisition of a startup I did, and realized that um, the, the machines in the data center and all the complexity were winning and the humans were losing a pretty important battle. We were spending about $300 billion in 2003 managing the world's data center, meaning with labor. And that number is growing uh, about 150% a year greater than the capital we spend in the data center. And from a macro standpoint, it's like, well, okay, this can't continue. Um, so we went out to conquer that problem and did it in a, a very different way than the industry had been focused on it at the time. You're one of the first kind of freemium enterprise software apps, if I recall. Yeah, it was, I mean, it was a little accidental, right? I think when you, um, when you create a really simple solution to a complex problem and you first put it in front of a customer, they, they often don't believe you. They don't believe it'll work. And we had this problem. We created a, a search engine for machine-generated data so humans could understand what all this complex machinery was doing simply by searching. And when we gave it to customers and said, look, this is what we've built, um, you know, they kind of laughed at it and said, well, I've spent five and a half million dollars on IBM software and a million dollars on the maintenance contract alone. How's this thing going to do better than that? And so we gave it to them for free and we said, well, just try it. And they liked it and they came back for more. And we said, well, if you want to use it more, you got to pay us a little something. And they pay us something and then they started using it more. And we said, well, pay us a little more. And the whole thing just kind of built on itself. And when did it feel like a billion dollar company? <laughs> the day we went public. <laughs> <laughs> Not until then? You didn't feel like you were on the, on the ramp? Well, I mean, it was a really strange feeling in 2008 when the world was falling apart and we were growing at 300%. Um, customers were spending gobs of money with us. Um, and, you know, you travel around the world selling to customers and everyone's running for the hills and you're still selling software and collecting money, it did feel a little odd. Um, but yeah, I think, I mean, when you're a CEO once asked me, he said, how did you guys know when you really made it? Like you were really there and successful. And 
I think if you're an entrepreneur, you don't ever know. You know, you, you ship version two of the product and you're like, did anybody really use version one? It was horrible. <laughs> and as soon as you ship two, you're like, you're, you're on to three saying, well, we can't use, nobody will use two because look at all this stuff we have to build in three. And I think it's just the way entrepreneurs are. So, but you know, the day, the day we went public, we were the first company ever to crash the NASDAQ stock exchange auction system. And we did that simply because none of the institutional buyers wanted to part with the stock. When the retail buyers came in the morning, we went public. And the algorithms kept trying to match buyers with sellers. And clearly, the software wasn't written at Berkeley and <laughs> crashed the NASDAQ. Um, and I think at that moment, like I looked at my two co-founders and the 35 original people in the company who were all still at the company who were there on the NASDAQ floor. And we were all like, OK, this is pretty awesome. <laughs> But it's, it took nine years, right? I think until we really kind of patted ourselves on the back a little bit. That's really interesting. So I know you've thought about this because we've talked about it, but like, where do these billion dollar companies come from? Where do they come from? Um, you know, it's not like we go around to schools and find them. They find us. Um, we, we try to make students aware of what it is we can help them with and they seek us out, but well, let's back up for a second. Why did you start founder.org? Yeah, so. I mean, you could have been a VC, you could have. Yeah, I tried that for like two months. <laughs> <laughs> I joined a couple friends of mine down on Sand Hill Road in a partnership, and everybody kept walking in saying, We want you to help us create the, new, the next Splunk. I'm like, Well, I don't want to create the next Splunk. I want to do something else. So I had to get out of there to get away from that. Um, well, I mean, we're a startup at founder.org, and. We are um, not unlike any other startup, which is, uh, you know, it comes from your own passion. I mean, when, when an MBA walks into your office and says, hey, I want to be an entrepreneur, right? And those people don't, don't tend to really get that far. It's the ones that walk in and go, I'm really psyched about data center automation or the music industry or, you know, some kind of a problem they want to solve or some kind of a product they want to build, something they want to change in the world. Um, and and that, for me, that was founder.org. Um, I started a company as an undergraduate computer science major. I started my second company as, a, as an MBA student. And I, I know how hard it is. So, I mean, you know, I came to you. You were one of the first schools I came to and said, so, like, what's missing? You guys have an incubator and you teach this minimally viable product, product market fit, all this lean startup stuff. And, you know, we heard loud and clear from schools like Berkeley and from students was, well, there's a pretty big gap between graduating and learning the basics of entrepreneurship and understanding how to build a company. And so we set off to build a, a company building literacy program where, you know, if you'd done this for 25 years and started six companies, what would you want to teach somebody so that they could learn it a lot faster? Well, and I find it interesting that, you know, you put together both. So you, you give grants to companies, you invest in companies, and you have a huge educational and mentoring component. Yeah. And how did you decide what to put into the educational mentoring component? Well, I think first we started by saying we wanted to be a nonprofit because we wanted to try to make this go for 100 years. So we have a 25-year business plan now with our current endowment, um, and that's our investments, our grants, our operating money. Um, but, you know, we, we think we have a way of making that go for 100 years if we make smart investments in student companies. So all the investments we make, if we make money on them, the money comes back to our endowment to do more student entrepreneurship programs. Um, so we're maybe like one of the first nonprofit venture capital, you know, type of operations. Um, how do we decide what to put into it? Um, we started getting inundated last year with applications. We got over 500 applications in three weeks. And, uh, you know, being a quant guy, I thought, well, we better come up with some quantitative way to try to look at these things or we're never going to be able to process them in time. And um, we devised an eight-dimensional map of company building, and we scored every presentation on eight dimensions. We gave kids 20 minutes to present to us. Um, and we've since turned that into the basis of our whole company building literacy program. So one of the things that's interesting is, you know, you talk quantitative, but obviously something that's critical in startups is founders. Yeah. You even mentioned that in Splunk. Do you quantify that dimension? We do. We do. Um, we have a 1 to 10 scale for every dimension. And uh, on the founder dimension, we look at the number of founders. You know, single co-founder is really hard to get behind. Like if 
I get asked this question all the time, you know, I've got a great idea, I've validated my market, what should I do next? Go find a co-founder. You can't do this on your own. Um, so we look at number of founders, we look at diversity of founders, three MBAs, eh, not so good. Three computer science majors, eh, not so good. You need diversity, you have a lot of hats to wear. Um, the, the more different opinions, the better. Um, you know, it's kind of like a good marriage. The more squabbling, probably the better the household. I like it. Um, by the way, all of you have cards, and if you would like to ask Michael a question, fill out a card, pass it to the left, to the right, to the... There are folks there to, to collect your cards. Um, I, you know, one of the things we always try to teach at Berkeley is, is about scalability, right? And really getting out there and testing a business model and testing for scalability, you know, big enough market segments. Um, how do you look at the problem of scalability? And I say that from your perspective in founder.org. You're looking at student startup companies, people have ideas, maybe it's not the final idea. How do you really look at whether it's gonna scale? Like, is this? Yeah, so market is one of our eight dimensions that we look at. And um, look, the, the rule of disruptive innovation is if you have a disruptive innovation and you are successful, in five to 10 years, you'll get 10 to 20% of the available market. And that market may not have existed when you started, but however you define your available market, that's what you can consider getting if you're hyper successful in the market. So. If you want to create a high impact company, and I describe that by meaning a company that's employing hundreds or thousands of people, has hundreds or thousands of customers, right? So this isn't like the corner dry cleaner. This is, you know, high impact companies, Silicon Valley type companies. You better start with an available market in the first five years of at least five hundred million dollars. If you, you want to get, how do you measure to, that if it's a new market? It's yeah, it's it's right. it's it's hard, right? I mean, when we went about it at, at Splunk in 2003, um, we measured it in three ways. One was the market size for existing solutions, which was just a proxy because we were doing things very differently than the existing solutions. Um, the second way we measured it was because we had a freemium model. We looked at the potential number of end users for our product. And then we looked at the number of companies that could possibly buy our product, meaning companies that had an IT operation spend of $10 million or more. And we kind of put that all together and said, we think the available market's about $55 billion in the next five years. And we took that to the VC community and they laughed at us. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the things I find interesting about the Splunk business model is you were in there against IBM. You were in there against Accenture. You were, I mean, you were in there against the big guns with big sales force, aggressive sales forces. So how did you win those battles? Well, you know, and, and by the way, if you're Berkeley students or, or recent alumni, um, we have an event at Skydeck at Berkeley tomorrow night right. where we're launching our 100K competition for this year at Berkeley. I think it's at 6 or 6.30, 6.30 at Skydeck. Um, you can come and I give a talk called um, Lessons Building a Billion Dollar Business. And I talk about eight lessons learned. And I think the, the most important one is you've got to think about innovation in your business model. It is no longer good enough today to build an innovative product or service. You have to innovate in your business model. And it takes both of those in today's competitive world to produce a high impact company. Um, so we go through an exercise with our founder.org teams where we literally tell them to think about the business model exactly in the opposite direction of the way it's done today. So at, at Splunk, um, you know, IBM would walk into the CIO of an organization and try to sell them on a multi-million dollar, multi-year contract and software, and it takes a long time. Um, we had this free software that people could download to find problems. So if you're, you know, person sitting at Yahoo and your Cisco router keeps rebooting, what's the very first thing you're gonna do? You're going to Google it, right? I mean, IT guys are lazy, just like we are. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to bet that some smarter person posted the answer to this question. So we would buy Google AdWords against these issues, and it would come up and say, hey, you can download this cool Splunk software, and it can search all the logs on your router and tell you right where the problem is. So our business model was instantaneous with these customers, and IBM's was like months long. So we were just running circles around their sales team. Well, it's interesting to think of, you know, Google AdWords as your main sales channel. That's, that's anti-enterprise software. Well, that was Perfect it. example of the anti. 
Yeah. So when you look out today, is I mean, are there technology areas that you like or business model disruptions that you like as you look through your all these applications for founder.org? Well, I mean, I think obviously the digital health sector is just exploding. It's so exciting. Um, and the things that have come together to make that possible are, you know, a really complex healthcare system for both doctors and patients. And that's been going, you know, brewing for like 50 years. And we're finally at the point of so much frustration. But the other two key ingredients were mobile, smartphone technology. Every doctor's got one in their pocket now. And the maker movement of hardware as really the last mile connector between the digital world and the analog world. And in healthcare, that's having a huge impact. So, you know, I'm really excited about those kind of companies and excited about those companies going to market in a different kind of a way. Um, you know, Connor spoke earlier from Echo. Uh, they're a founder.org company in our program this year. And, um, you know, we're, we're looking at selling that on a subscription basis to doctors where it's based on the number of transactions they do every month. I mean, that's a completely <laughs> radical way to think about selling healthcare technology. Very interesting. So, uh, so how do you see Founder.org evolving as you go? You're only in year two, right? Year two, yeah. yeah. How do we see it evolving? Well, you know, we uh, we have a number of our management team members here today, um, but we're you know we really think about expanding in kind of three different dimensions. One is geographic, so we have 12 schools in the U.S. today and um, 13 in Europe now. So we've expanded into Europe this year. Um, and these are partner schools like Berkeley that we work with. Our program is exclusive to the partner schools we work with. So we're really trying to be an extension of the university out into the real world with this company building methodology. Um, so geographic expansion is one. Um, our education program around the company building literacy, um, you know, like most people, we've moved it all online. We're scaling it up. Um, we're inviting 50 teams this year into our, our program. Last year we only had 10. Um, and then the third thing we look at is uh, capital expansion. We have a, a U.S. $100 million fund today um, that we're investing in student companies with. Um, but as I look at our student companies, they have a huge, huge challenge in the Series A gap. Yep. You know, make no mistake, there's a huge problem with Series A funding today. Only 36% of companies that get seed funding and go to an incubator get Series A funding. That means 64% don't. That's a huge problem. So, you know, we think in the future about how we might expand our capital pool to, to solve some of the Series A gap for these student teams. Very interesting. So, so here's a question from the audience. Thinking about exit strategies, should entrepreneurs think about their exit or should they think about solving real problems? <laughs> I mean, obviously you've got to think about the problem you're solving. That's, you know, without the desire to change the status quo of something in the world that's meaningful, um, you don't have a big business. The only reason I say somebody should think about their exit is if you're working on a small, you know, size business that's never going to grow to 50, 100 million dollars in revenue, you have to think about capitalizing it in a very different way than you'd capitalize a typical Silicon Valley startup. But for Silicon Valley startups, people that are thinking about exits, I mean, these are the vacationing entrepreneurs. They're not the real ones, right? Change <laughs> six. <laughs> Uh, can you name the characteristics of successful teams? How many founders? What are they like? And what's most important? Yeah, there's a, a whole piece that I'll do tomorrow on billion dollar companies. Um, turns out there's, there's $39 billion tech companies that were started in the last decade. And I've taken a look at those teams and, and dissect the characteristics of the founders. And you know, on average, three founders per team, uh, well-educated, have worked together before. Um, and I think from a characteristic standpoint, there's sort of three things we look at that, that most successful, hyper successful founders have in common. That the one we've talked about, which is this desire to change the status quo of something, build a product, solve a problem. Um, the second is, um, you know, this is really hard work, right? I mean, you want an easy job, Go work in investment banking, management consulting. Like, <laughs> this is for the real people that want to do real work. Um, so, you know, the second thing is if if you're going to walk around every day and be told your idea is stupid by your professor and your spouse and venture capitalists, 
you got to be a little bit delusional, so we look for that. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, the third thing is you, you got to be audacious. Like this is for not the, not for the meek at heart. You have to sell employees, co-founders, venture capitalists, early customers when you don't even have a finished product. Most importantly, every day you have to wake up and sell your family on why you're doing this. Um, you know, you you got to be pretty bold and audacious to do that. And I, I mean, I'll be honest with you, like. Berkeley is one of my favorite schools in the U.S. that we work with, and I think the thing that I love about it the most is the teams that we work with and all the teams we met at Berkeley last year just, you know, the kids have this humble confidence about them that is just so reassuring in terms of building credibility with their audience, um, and I, I think that's the key is to be audacious, but, but do it without being arrogant. Would you call that confidence without attitude? <laughs> I would, I would. Then our, that would make our dean very happy. Woohoo! Thank you, Rich. I was trying not to plagiarize. <laughs> so, Alex, how do you balance innovating new versions of a product, and they say specifically, but keep founder.org from getting too complex? Yeah, well. Because um, you are iterating your product. I mean, we are rapidly, really interesting, right? Um, I think customers pay you for the things that you do that are different. And whatever startup you have, you know, you'll have a product roadmap. And as you look at that product roadmap and you start selling to customers, customers will start asking you for all kinds of things that aren't on that roadmap. You know, the kinds of things that you need to fit into their organization or to integrate with their other consumer products or whatever it is. Um, and it's a really hard thing to say no to that, especially when a customer's got a big check they're waving in front of you. But it's super easy to get sidetracked into that and forget about the reason why customers bought you in the first place. Um, we solved this problem in, in an interesting way at Splunk. We took our product roadmap for 24 months and we put it on the web. And we let people come in and upvote or downvote different parts of it. <laughs> crowdsource your product It was a crowdsource product. I mean, we didn't have that term at the time, but it was a crowdsource product roadmap. And it gave us tremendous feedback and our, you know, people said, oh, you're crazy, your competitors will look at it, et cetera. I mean, you know, most of us stopped signing NDAs in Silicon Valley like 10 years, 20 years ago. It's about execution, it's not about the idea. So we weren't really concerned about that because we had the confidence we could move way faster than our competitors. Now, one of the things I find most confusing for early stage entrepreneurs these days is the funding environment. It's like it used to be, you had your angels, you had your VCs, if you went public, you had investment banks. Yeah. Now you have angels, you have super angels, you have accelerators, you have founder.org, right? That never existed. And these crazy nonprofits, um, yeah. These crazy nonprofits. So when you work with your entrepreneurs, how do you help them kind of through that just insanely complicated funding landscape? But I, I think the seed is not all that difficult. There's still a lot of seed money out there. Um, but we get asked a lot by entrepreneurs, how do I find angel seed investors? I said, well, you get them as advisors way before you need money. And then by the time you need money, if they're not the first ones to hold up their hand, you better think about doing a different business. Um, as far as the Series A thing goes, and look, there's only a certain number of organizations writing one to $5 million Series A checks these days. And you need to figure out who are the ones that are writing checks for your kind of company in your geography, at your stage, in your industry, and really focus on them. And we help our teams do that, build a targeted strategy of who they're going to go after. I see so many entrepreneurs waste time with investors that will never write a check for their kind of company. And how do they figure that out? Well, you know, we have databases um, that we buy that we give our teams access to. We have, I mean, huge numbers of contacts in the venture industry. We know who the people are that are writing these checks and we make warm introductions. Um, but it's, you know, this is part of our curriculum. They actually have a challenge in the third quarter to come up with the top 10 Series A investors for their company. And they don't get credit for the third quarter <laughs> curriculum until they've done that task. Very interesting model. Uh should I start a company with my best friend? Who thinks you should start a company with your best friend? <laughs> well, the three people that have their hands up are right. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. Um, if you're serious about this entrepreneurial stuff, this is a you know, seven day a week, 365 day a year kind of activity. You're not going to have time for any other friends. 
So you might as well have at least one good friend. <laughs> no, but seriously, there, there's a man named Jeffrey Smart who's written a book called Who, and it's required reading in our first quarter curriculum. Um, and it's all about a player mentality. And, and he's done research over 40 years and discovered the number one thing that identifies successful employee populations and customers is people when surveyed will say they have a best friend at work. They spend more time at work, they get more creative, they work harder, they think out of the box more often. Um, and this is you know, completely orthogonal to what I learned at business school, although I didn't go to Haas, so. There you go. <laughs> but it's, it's the new reality. So here's a good question. So it says, we're in the middle of a bubble. Um, and then the question is, are we in the middle of a bubble or is this really the beginning of a new wave? I don't think we're in the middle of the bubble. Um, I look at the public market and I see a few, you know, high growth stocks that, you know, might be overpriced right now. But if you look at, I mean, if you look at the classic public market indicators, the S&P uh, multiple, the Dow multiple of, of earnings or revenues, we're actually pretty far below where we were when the world crashed in 2002, 2003. Um, the NASDAQ is just back to where it was uh, in 2002. Um, the other reason, though, that I don't think we're in a bubble is as, as I travel around the world and I'm spending a lot of time in Europe these days and I look at how digital technology, particularly the smartphone, has driven digital technology into so many places where it never was before and how much easier it is to travel around the world today and make your own travel arrangements, uh, deal with you know, finding places to go and things to do and, and places to eat. And you never have to deal with, you know, a foreign translator or a travel agent. I mean, the world's just become a much, much smaller place. And guess what? All these people around, running around Europe are using digital services built by companies in California. So the market is so much bigger than it was just five years ago for all of these, you know, great things that our startups are cranking out that I'm pretty confident that we're entering uh, an expanding market and, and not a bubble economy. Very cool. So, so my last question was, you know, for the folks out there in the audience, our, our budding entrepreneurs, both students and alumni, what's the thing they should do to find a billion dollar startup? I mean, it's follow your passion, right? Find something you're super passionate about and um, whether it's something you want to create or a problem that you want to solve. Um, and obviously, you know, like you guys teach in the Lean Launchpad, get out and talk to customers. Um, we didn't have Lean Launchpad back in 2003 when we started Splunk, but we did have something, and that was the three of us had started two companies before, and one of them, we were way ahead of the market with our technology, like 10 years. Um, we spent the four, first 14 months of that company at Splunk just talking to customers. We interviewed 62 data center managers, anybody that would talk to us, and of course, every customer you talk to, you get two more names to talk to. Um, we videotaped them. Um, we still have them in the archives at the company, uh, and it was just an invaluable body of knowledge that we based so many things in the company on. Fantastic. All right, Michael, thank you.